This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. Kicking off today's show is K-State's Drew Ricketts and Joe Gherkin with another episode of their Fins, Fur, and Feathers podcast. This week, they discuss grass management for wildlife and how livestock can play a beneficial role. Sandy Johnson, K-State Beef Reproduction Specialist, and John Holman, K-State Cropping Systems and Forage Agronomist, continue the show by talking through reminders for people wanting cattle to graze cover crops. K-State Dairy Specialist Micah Brook finishes today's show with the importance of proper feed bunk management and how the use of cameras and feed pushers can help prevent the feed bunk from becoming dry. That and more is coming up ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Tuesday show with another episode of K-State's Drew Ricketts and Joe Gherkin's podcast, Fins, Fur, and Feathers. Well, welcome back to another episode of Fins, Fur, and Feathers. And Drew, you're going to talk to us today about some habitat management. I wanted to do a few episodes here, maybe in a row, at least the ones that I'm leading, about managing wildlife habitat in the Great Plains and really how it's different from what a lot of people are used to. And so that's really just a basic introduction to that stuff, maybe this week, and then we can start going into thinking about it in more detail in some of the following episodes. So if we're thinking about deer, deer don't eat a lot of tall fescue. They could starve to death on it if that's all you had out there for them. They want to eat forbs or the broadleaf plants and woody species that produce browse. And when you've got that cool season monoculture out there, there's not really anything else for them to eat. If we're thinking about a species like quail, that sod-forming grass gets so dense that even if it's good nesting cover for an adult quail to make a nest in, when those chicks hatch, they can't fly and that grass is too thick for them to get from the nest to their brood rearing cover. And I'm getting way ahead of where we're probably supposed to be right now, but that's why those cool season grasses can be not a good thing for wildlife. We're kind of focusing on habitat today, so maybe let's start by defining that. What is habitat? Yeah, so from the most basic standpoint, there's four components of habitat. It's the food, cover, water, and space that basically any critter needs to survive. And, you know, food can be lots of different things. If we're thinking about a herbivore like a deer, then food is going to be some sort of plant material, right? If we're thinking about a predator like a coyote, coyote's probably not the best example because they're so omnivorous, but, you know, a coyote's diet may be composed of anything from mice all the way to, to plums and maybe everything in between. So, so food is a pretty simple concept. Water is the next easy one, right? Water can come in a couple of different forms, actually three forms. So we call free water anything that you can see as water, right? It may not be a pond. It may be a drop of dew, depending on what critter we're talking about. Preformed water is water that comes from the animal's diet, and it's actually water that's contained in the stuff that it's eating. So let's say a muskrat eats a cattail. And there are some critters that can survive basically entirely on preformed water. They don't have to drink. And then the extreme end of this is metabolic water. And so that's basically water that's produced when an animal breaks down the molecules in the food that they're eating. Water can be produced as a byproduct of that. And there, there's not very many mammals. Uh, there's probably more birds, I would guess, that can get by on that kind of water. But it's typically going to be desert-adapted species that have that sort of thing. Cover is probably the most complex of all of this because most critters have a bunch of different cover requirements. So breaking it down from a basic standpoint, I learned that most ground nesting birds need nesting, resting, brood rearing, and escape cover. And, of course, a feeding place is probably going to be included in those different kinds of cover. But the important thing to remember is that most critters need pretty complex structure and composition to whatever they're getting their cover from. Space, you know, we're not talking about the final frontier, we're, we're talking about typically a home range for a critter. 
and since we're talking about quail a lot, I guess you know the the minimum home range could be somewhere between somewhere around five acres if we had really really dense resources for all the food and different cover requirements that they needed in a small area. The more spread out those resources are, the bigger their home range has to be. And so the way that I like to teach people to think about space is that you've got all the food cover and water requirements available to that critter in a small enough area that it can get to those things and and carry out all of its natural history within its annual cycle. And the more dense that is, the more of those critters you can have in one place, up to a point. So a lot of times we're managing these lands, you know, a lot of our listeners aren't just focused on the wildlife, they're focused on livestock production as well. And so figuring out the balance there, right? I mean, some of the things we're doing for livestock aren't necessarily the best things to do for wildlife. How do you... How do you balance those two things? Sure. I think that one of the things that that is very different about managing wildlife in the Great Plains versus managing for wildlife, let's say in the eastern U.S., is a lot of the areas that we're managing for wildlife are also used for, for, let's say, cattle production. But let's say we're managing for deer in an area that's got a lot of native grass cover in it that's never been plowed, so a lot of native prairie. You can actually use cattle to produce better habitat in that native prairie than you can if you're not using cattle because the cattle very generally can you know as they eat grasses they reduce the stature of those grasses which allows the the broadleaf plants to to then grow up and a lot of those broadleaf plants are going to provide food and cover to the critters that we want to manage for i think that's really surprising to a lot of people when you mention it to them you know they think a lot of people buy land and they want to hunt it or something the first thing they do is go out there and get those cattle off of it right and so and that's not always the best practice to do. So, yeah, raising wildlife, raising livestock, a little bit different. You know, well, you know, there's livestock we can throw in a pen and throw stuff at them all day. Can't really do that with wildlife. That's right, and that that's one of the things that really shapes the way we think about limiting factors or think about adjusting carrying capacity a lot of times. So, you know, we can take a, a pretty small area and we can grow a whole lot of beef in that area by putting a lot of feed in there. So if the main things that that we're manipulating in, let's say, a feedlot setting are the amount of food, the amount of water, and the amount of cattle, we can really produce a lot of cattle in a small space. But what's very different about that than wildlife is there's several things, but we're we're not trying to promote reproduction in a feedlot setting. We are also managing density dependent factors or things that would affect a species more or less as it becomes more or less abundant in an area. So lots of those kind of things, let's say density dependent mortality factors, we want to think about that. Well, disease is a density dependent mortality factor. The more critters of species X that you have congregated in a small area, the more likely there is to be a disease that infects them. The disease is going to spread more rapidly and you might have catastrophic losses for that. Well, in a feedlot setting, we're doctoring those critters, right? And so we're reducing that that density dependence there. We also don't have to worry too much about predation in that sort of setting. If we're producing sheep, then we do need to manage predation, but we can still manage that predation with some of the different practices that we use to prevent or control predation. We can't do that very well in wildlife a lot of times in these free-ranging populations. And then the other thing that that we're we're also controlling or, or not dealing with in a feedlot is that longevity of the individual animals is not really an issue because we're taking young animals, we're putting them on feed, and we're growing them up to one and a half or two years old, and then those are going to be harvested and they're going to be turned into beef to go on the shelf. So they don't have to get old in order to be able to reproduce or to, to get the characteristics we want. And so just pouring food and water at most critters without figuring out that food or water is the limiting factor is really a it's not a good way to be successful at trying to manage free-ranging populations of wildlife. Are a lot of these management you know, ideas, recommendations you're giving, are those going to vary based on where you're at geographically? Or are these kind of, you know, these are good practices wherever you are? Things can be very different in different places. You know, if we're thinking about managing 
for wildlife, and I'm saying wildlife in general right now, there are very, very few, I mean very few instances where I'm going to come look at your property and tell you you ought to be planting trees. And that blows a lot of people away because a lot of in a lot of parts of the country, we associate trees or some sort of woody cover with wildlife habitat for a lot of species. And the density of deer that you can grow in western Kansas might be a lot lower than the density of deer that you can grow in eastern Kansas. But you can have white-tailed deer habitat and grow really nice deer in western Kansas and have very little tree cover on the landscape. They're probably going to have some somewhere. But in that instance, you know, a a patch of CRP grass or native prairie that's been introduced out there to replace some cropland is serving the same role for cover for those deer that eastern deciduous forest type cover might provide in a different place. And then the other thing, too, is terrain can provide cover. So that's a totally different way of thinking about it. But, you know, a lot of the white-tailed deer in western Kansas are using canyons and, and stuff like that for cover instead of woody cover or tall grasses and that sort of thing. Look forward to talking about more of the specifics in future episodes, Drew. That was a a lot of fun to talk about. So, again, that came from, you know, a listener reaching out and saying, hey, here's here's an idea to talk about. And so keep those ideas coming our way. Our contact information's in the show notes, and we appreciate you listening. So look forward to having you next time. Once again, that was Joe Gherkin and Drew Ricketts. You can listen to this full episode of Fins, Fur, and Feathers on the podcast streaming platform of your choice, or I will also link it in today's show notes. We're cutting to a short break now on agriculture today, but stick around because we have more for you ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we continue our Tuesday show talking about grazing cover crops. And then to talk about it, we're joined by K-State Beef Reproduction Specialist Sandy Johnson and K-State Cropping Systems and Forage Agronomist John Holman. Sandy, John, thank you both so much for taking the time to join us today. Glad to be here. Thank you, Shelby. Thank you, Shelby. John, as we're thinking about grazing cover crops, when should people maybe start getting those animals onto the fields? So the first, the first thing to do and, and it, it's going to be a little bit species uh dependent right so if we're thinking about cool season type species then the first thing we want to make sure is the crop is crop is well rooted so if, if, it, if you turn cattle on too soon we'll just pull the plant out of out of the ground right and so we want we want to avoid avoid that now other, some other species such as uh forage or sorghum sedan or early early in the growth of that plant there's risk of prussic acid and so with those plants we want to have them be at least 18 to 20 inches tall and how can producers identify how much forage they have out there on the field well that's a that's a good question uh a little bit of that comes from you know experience right so looking at how much is there looking at and you're also going to have to estimate if the crop is still growing what the what the soil moisture conditions are what the outlook is so you kind of have to to assess what is there, but also assess what the what the growth potential is going to be in the in the near future. And one of the challenges we have is uh, in in moisture limited regions like Western Kansas is not every year is the same. So one one year your your production is going to could be very very low, and the, and then the next year you could have have a, have a lot of production. So having flexibility built into your to, to your system to be able to uh, adjust that stocking st- stocking density. How do you go about determining what that stocking rate should be? Well, to me, it goes back to that pounds of production and density. And, you know, depending on if you've planted a cocktail or a monoculture, that may be much more difficult. I, I think with a monoculture, we, we can use some of our rules of thumb that we might use for grazing wheat or other cereal grains. And, you know, we want that uh, good six inches tall. And as John said, well rooted before we go out and graze on it. And then as we start mixing species, it gets much more complicated in, in trying to estimate, estimate that, but still you're going to want to, you know, in general, that, 
uh, amount of, of growth to get started and then knowing whether or not you've got soil moisture uh, for continued and, and regrowth. And, you know, if we're talking springtime of the year and, and we have moisture and some regrowth, then things are looking rosy and you've got a, a little bit of, of flex there and how you do that. How long on average do cattle stay on a cover crop, even though, John, you did mention there is quite a bit of variability? Uh, sure. Well, again, that's going to be species uh, dependent, right? So, so if we think about, uh, let's go, let's just walk through, let's just walk through the whole calendar year. Okay. So if we plant something in the fall, like uh, maybe uh, winter treated Kaylee, for example, we might be able to turn cattle on uh, sometime mid-November and those cattle could be out there through maybe up to pushing the first of June before that crop is completely uh, done growing and grazed out. Again, this will depend on how uh, your, your stocking density and the forage production, how much forage production you have, right? A spring, a spring crop planted the end of February, first of March, uh, that's going to be a much shorter season crop there. You could, you know, look to turn out on that sometime, uh, probably in, in April and it could be, it'd be done um also by by june so you know much a shorter window there maybe you know 30 45 days a growing season for that uh you know summer crop depending on the type of the type of crop we're talking about maybe planting it sometime in in the first of june and being able to turn out on that uh 45 days 45 days later and really depending on the regrowth of the species and and stocking density allowing the plant to recover and regrow and maybe with some rotational rotational grazing uh you could graze that clear up clear up through a, fr- a freeze event or even stockpile some of that for for grazing af- after a freeze event and sandy john mentioned rotational grazing but there's a few different options just besides rotational grazing that cattle producers could be using right you know the rotational is typically our way to more fully utilize the forage that's available and depending on, you know, how much forage is there and how much time you want to put into that, th- that may or may not be the best option. Uh, obviously, we can continually graze. Uh, we can re- rotationally graze. Uh, we can do something called strip grazing, which it is, uh, you know, essentially giving them a little bit more, you know, each week, uh, each day, depending on, you know, what your intensity is. You know, in, in our spring planted covers, trying to graze those, uh, what we found out here is our, our length of grazing period is usually uh, 30 to 40 days at the max. And so, you know, on, the, on some of the early things that, um, that they grazed, if you do that in a rotational fashion and you have some moisture, graze this piece, move on to the next there's possibility that you could come back to that earliest graze again in a really optimal moisture year, uh, but that's not necessarily always the case. But as we've uh, worked with these systems, uh, there's certainly been times where, yeah, there's just as much on that first grazed rotational spot as as, uh, the ungrazed areas. When, When you're not in that type of moisture situation, you know, then the rotational certainly helps protect you and, you know, your ability to get in and take forage off a place, you know, a piece of ground and move on to the next is is really the way to utilize the forage uh, best. If you use some type of strip grazing, you know, tied all into this is what, what your water source is. And, you know, if you strip graze and allow them to walk back over what they previously grazed, um, if, if we have some moisture situation, then th- they may be tempted to come back to that new lush regrowth. And so, you know, there, there's a whole lot of it depends on on what that best method is. But suggestion is to use your portable fencing and think about how you can best allocate that. And, you know, there, there's some good forage there that can be used to, you know, delay your use of native pastures if you're willing to spend a little bit of time and thought in applying it. John, when it comes to cattle grazing like this, are there things from a crop field perspective we need to keep in mind? Certainly, Shelby. You know, we want to we want to make sure that we don't uh, overgraze the the field and, and and leave the ground really bare of any residue cover. 
and depending on where 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 the where we're at in the crop rotation, right? That that'll uh, dictate that a little bit of how 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 much protection we want to leave. You know, if we're talking about planting, uh, say, corn or sorghum into a fallen spring cover, and we're going to be getting a crop up very soon, right? That's not as uh, having a lot of residue on the ground is maybe not is not as critical from a soil erosion standpoint we're going to have a crop growing pretty soon all that residue still provides us benefits from a evaporation standpoint within that within that next growing crop so keeping some residue cover is is really important it's a lot easier to keep residue cover if the cattle are grazing a more fully developed crop at turnout then you're going to get a lot more trampling versus growing something that's shorter and actively gr- uh, growing it's going to be harder to keep keep the cattle as, as Sandy mentioned from from not overgrazing some of those some of those areas if the field is very wet we can run into some uh, soil compaction issues especially around the livestock watering area or traffic lanes if we what up if we if we have if we're set up where we have native pasture adjacent to that field and we can move cattle onto that native pasture for a day or two to let that ground dry up a little bit um, you know that that's an ideal uh, situation for them. If people would like to find out more information on this topic, where could they do that? We have a we have a couple of different uh, extension publications on on cover crop grazing. One on on the spring type cro- crops, and the other on on su- on summer crops. Uh, in addition to those, we have a lot of different publications on. You know these various forage types, as far as planting rates, uh, you know seeding rates, fertility management, uh, and those types of things. I would say, in, in addition, uh, you know, folks could feel free to reach out to uh, either Sandy or myself or their or their local county agent. John, Sandy, I appreciate you both taking the time to join us today and share with us some information about grazing cover crops. Glad to be here. Thank, thank you. That was Kansas State University cropping systems and forage agronomist John Holman, and he was joined by K-State beef reproduction specialist Sandy Johnson. In today's show notes on actday.net, I will put links to resources if you'd like to find more information about this topic. I will also put the email address for John and Sandy if you'd like to reach out to them with questions. We're cutting to a short break now on agriculture today, but when we come back will be joined by K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook for this week's Milk Lines. This is Agriculture Today. Along with Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. We end today's program with this week's Milk Lines. The feed side of the dairy operation accounts for 50 to 55 percent of expenses. K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook says that proper feed bunk management can increase milk production in the herd and increase the marginal milk production in animals. He explains how the use of cameras and feed pushers can help prevent the feed bunk from becoming dry, especially between midnight and the 5 a.m. feeding. Today I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy producers concerning increasing marginal milk production. As we look at the revenue and expenses on our dairy farms, one of the things that we really need to consider during this time of tight margins is how we increase marginal milk. That would be increased milk production without creating a lot of additional expense. So as we start to look at our records, one of the things we need to consider is considerable amount of our expenses actually do come from the feed side of the equation, usually 50 to 55 percent, maybe in some cases a little bit more than that. So as we look at trying to increase margin, it seems as though that would be an area to take a look at. And oftentimes we look at things like feed shrink or forage quality or wet feeds and spoilage of those types of feeds. However, today I want to encourage you to look at something a little bit different. It's called feed bunk management. You know, on many of our dairies today, we really tend to limit the amount of refusals that we have in the bunk at the end of the day. We do this to try to control our feed cost. However, what this does is it actually creates a situation where we may have 
an empty bunk for a considerable part of the day. And on many of our farms, that's going to occur sometime between midnight and 5 or 6 a.m., whenever we deliver the first feed of the day. So my question on your dairy, who's watching during this time? Cameras can really help us with this and identify when we are running a little bit low on feed and maybe need to up that feeding during the day so that we can actually make it through the night and still have feed available. Again, for lactating cows, we really need to have feed available at least 21 hours a day. And if you're looking at early lactation cows, high-producing pins, you probably need to be closer to 23 hours a day. The bunk really should never go completely dry. Now, here's the challenge for all of our dairies. Many times we have overstocking on our pens. In other words, we probably have more animals in the pen than we actually have feed bunk spaces. Keep in mind that this creates a competitive situation for our dairy animals. So as you think about this competitive feeding, particularly if you are overstocking your pens to a certain extent, you need to be very mindful about how you manage that bunk after you deliver feed. You know, it's really important that we do a push-up probably about 30 to 45 minutes after we deliver the fresh feed to the pen. This will allow animals that are coming in that second wave of feeding to have access to feed that is fresh and will eliminate some of the sorting issues that we sometimes have from the first wave. Sometimes this is difficult to do based on our available labor. One of the things that has really helped us is the robotic feed pushers. We're seeing those installed on many conventional dairies. We used to just see those with robotic dairies, but today that is an option to get feed pushed up on a regular scale. And if we do use feed push-ups on a regular basis, we can increase feeding time. Generally, this will actually increase the amount of time that animals spend laying down. This will increase our milk production. Keeping in mind for every one pound of increase in dry matter intake, we should see about a three pound increase in milk production in the herd. Some studies have shown that increasing feed push-up on a dairy can increase milk production by as much as eight pounds per cow per day. So again, for a minimal investment in increased pushing, as well as increasing our intensity of bunk management, we can impact milk production in our dairy herd and increase the marginal milk production in our animals. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairy farmers not to miss the opportunities that they have to improve feed bunk management to increase intake in their dairy herd. Thanks, Mike. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.